I mentioned at the start of, of this kind of discussion or early on in this discussion that there's two stated reasons why these things have to come in. The first is to be compliant with the World Trade Organization, okay, because the waiver that allowed the, the previous schemes is going to run out. The second is that because they haven't worked, the existing ones, the old ones haven't worked, they haven't boosted the economic development of the poor countries concerned. Now, a lot of people would argue that there's a third reason, which goes back to the question of the, of the General Agreement on Trade and Services, which is to allow European exporters better access to these markets. So that's, that kind of self-interest argument is often advanced by organisations like Tradecraft and Christian Aid and others. And there's probably something in it. And part of the evidence for that is that there, when the EU is negotiating these agreements, they're trying not just to introduce reciprocal free trade, to get rid of tariff barriers. They're also trying to get the countries concerned to sign up to a whole set of economic policies and practices. So, for example, they want the African countries and others to liberalise public procurement, to uh, allow European firms to bid for public works contracts um, without supporting or prioritising local contractors. They want to liberalise all service sectors. So it's not just the sectoral requests that you had with the General Agreement on Trade and Services. They want to build into these economic partnership agreements a commitment to liberalise the service sector in its entirety, again allowing European firms access. And they want to make sure these countries reform their investment regulations to ensure that European firms receive at least as favourable treatment as local firms, again meaning that African and other countries would not be allowed to uh, discriminate in favour of locally owned firms or require European companies to abide by certain conditions. They'll be able to penetrate the service sectors, they'll be able to uh, repatriate in profits and operate their investments more freely with less regulation, they'll be able to crack open public procurement contracts and so on. Of the overall effort to build up the economic governance framework, the stable, transparent and predictable rules necessary to lower the costs of doing business, attract fresh domestic or foreign investment, make producers more diversified and competitive. You have to make these things comprehensive, dealing with all the rules and issues that concern private investors and traders. So things like investment rules, they say, are not a luxury. They're fundamental factors. If you don't get these right, you're not going to promote economic development. It's seeking to dictate to other countries what their policies should be across a whole range of areas of regulation. Uh, again, a quote from a Commission memorandum with a very classic example of Commission speak. Everyone should acknowledge that investment, public procurement and competition policy are essential parts of successful economic governance. Because it's not just an attempt to crack open foreign markets, it's not just trade, it is actually an attempt to, to govern or to impose a governance model, which of course is the characteristic of, 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 of a colonial framework. It's the actual assumption on the part of an external power of the right uh, to, to dictate how a country should be governed politically or economically.